Uh, hi everyone. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, multigrid methods for the good Helmholtz equation. It's a form of the Helmholtz equation that's a little bit simpler. Um, I'll talk about it in a minute. We, we like to use it as a, a way of testing these sort of um, different types of solvers. Um, and I'll talk about sort of where I'm at right now and what we need to be, what we're looking to do going forward uh, with this project. So first, let's just talk about a little bit of what we're what we're going to be looking at, sort of the literature review. Um, so uh, we have some basic system of equations, a linear system of equations, AX equals B. Um, you know, everyone knows this system. Um, but consider how do we solve this when, you know, let's say your coefficient matrix A is very large and very sparse, meaning there's a lot of zeros in the matrix um, and not a lot of actual numbers. Um, what if the order N of the matrix, you know, the matrix A is N by N. So what if order N is so large that we can't really afford a, something like a Gaussian elimination, which is a complexity of n cubed. Um, you know, if n is going to be a million, then uh, it's going to take forever to do n cubed operations. Um, and what if we don't have direct access to the matrix? And also, what if the matrix A exists only as a subroutine that returns some uh, vector A times V uh, given some input V vector? So we don't even have access to A to do something like Gaussian elimination. So what do we do in these situations? So multigrid is a method developed in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, it's an iterative method for the solution of linear and nonlinear equations that uses solutions on the fine and the cor and coarse grids um, to speed up calculations. So basically at its, at its core, it consists of these three pieces. You have a local solver on uh, your fine grid called a smoother. You have a coarse grid solver, and you have a mapping between the coarse and the fine grids. So why are we interested in multigrid? Um, this is a basic convergence comparison um, for some fusion, 1D and 2D fusion boundary value problem, uh, some arbitrary kind of PDE. Um, and as you can see, uh, multigrid converges way faster than Jacobi. I mean, in, in 100 iterations, Jacobi doesn't even get near convergence. Um, and multigrid is converged within 20 iterations for 1D on top and 2D on the bottom. Um, so it represents a massive speed up in our uh, runtime. And when our problems are really large, this is really important. Doing something like Jacobi on something that has a million, you know, a, 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 you know N by N is a million by a million is just unreasonable. Um, so this is a really big uh, speed up for that. So like I said, there's three components to this. There's a smoother, which handles details on the fine grid. Um, the smoother is something inexpensive, um, uh, like a Jacobi method um, on the fine grid because we're only really interested in local um, solutions. So um, Jacobi works at, on a local level. Um, uh, so we'll use that for the smoother. And then the coarse grid or the coarse solver um, handles sort of more of a global solution. Um, and for that, we use a little bit more of an arduous solver. Um, but because um, we're using that, we're also going to be doing it on the coarse grid, which allows it to run a little bit faster uh, and decrease the problem size. And then we have some mapper, which interpolates between fine and coarse grids. Um, and in simplest form, this mapper can be something like, um, let's say you have a fine grid, you just average the neighboring cells that would be within the coarse grid cell. Um, and that average is just what is going to be the value in the coarse grid. Um, now it could get much more complex, obviously, and there's many versions of this mapper, but that's, you know, in its most basic form, what you could do. So uh, one more thing I want to touch on is Krylov subspace methods or solvers, um, which we'll be using a lot as our uh, coarse solvers um, because they're uh, very good solvers. Um, so basically what a Krylov method is, is a way of solving this AX equals B by repeatedly performing some matrix vector multiplication involving A. Um, basically what you would get is you would get A um, times B um, repeatedly, A times B and then A squared times B and then A cubed times B. Um, technically speaking, the vector can be something other than B, but pretty much every example we have will be this vector B. So we just pretty much commonly say A times B. Um, and you get this space um, generated by these multiplications um, uh, called your Krylov subspace. 
Um, and this is a basic example conjugate gradient I'll be using later, uh, and I'll show it. It's a pretty fast example. These were developed in the 60s right before multigrid as a way of speeding up um, your, you know, your Jacobi and your Gaussian methods. Um, and they do re work really well at speeding up. Uh, I won't go over the algorithm, but this is one algorithm you can use. So problem formulation. So what I talked about before is we're going to be using this good Helmholtz equation. Uh, typically, the simple, you know, the most basic form of the Helmholtz equation has some constant k squared or c squared before your second u term, um, the u without the derivative. Um, but this is a little tricky to solve. Um, using multigrid and using some other methods. So what we do is we define this good Helmholtz equation where your constant goes to one, so you have no constant in this equation. Um, and then we have these two boundary conditions. Um, so u on the surface gamma d is going to be zero, and then um, the dot product between the gradient um, u and the normal vector coming off of this gamma n surface is going to be some arbitrary g we'll talk about a little bit later. So we need some discretization of this system of equations, and for that we turn to finite element methods. Um, so for finite element methods and for what Petsy uses, uh, Petsy being the program that I'm using for this, um, or the library that I'm using for this solve, we need a weak form or a variational form. So to get that, we multiply by some test function v, and then we integrate over the domain. We take that first term and we perform integration by parts on it, and then we get this um, surface term, the surface integral, um, which we, as you can see, we can apply some boundary condition to to get V times G um, and an integral over the surface. And lastly, we decide that um, this text, fun just for simplicity of this equation, we, ass we assume that the test function V vanishes on the boundary wherever U is known. And that gives us this final form of our weak form um, that we're going to be using in our finite element equation. Um, so we need to discretize this. this that's, a, that's a continuous form. This is a continuous form of the weak form. So we need to discretize it. So we have, we plug in this u sub h, which is a discretized form of u. Um, and then we need to construct, this is a much more complicated process, but I'll just talk about it really simply. We basically need to construct a pair of discrete trial and test spaces that um, your u and your v will uh, be derived from. So we assume that we have some basis phi j for your trial function, your trial space, and then you have a basis phi i for your test space. Um, and we're going to plug that into the equation that allows us to use basis functions that we have, you know, we know uh, we can use more simply. Um, so we'll let um, this discretized form of u, uh, equal the sum of your basis function phi j times this big u j which is your vector of degrees of freedom. Um, and then we can take that and we can plug that along with the basis function for the other, uh, for the test functions, and uh, plug that into our variational form and we get this equation 11, um, which if you know, looks just like, or can be made to look just like a uh, linear system, A u equals b. Um, and that's great because we have tons of, because uh, all these methods we're using to solve these are for line linear systems. So we now have a linear system. Um, so one more thing, um, when, because I'm interested in developing um, solvers and not so much interested in solving a real physics problem right now, um, I'm gonna be using this method of manufactured solutions, which is a method in which you define your solution U um, and then you use that solution um, to develop to get um, your f your right side function and then you, what you want is you want your code to spit out a solution that should be identical to your initial exact solution so you have a, a, a way of checking whether your your method is working whether your solver is working because you already know the solution um, so I use this um, trig function as my exact solution and then you can derive f from that um, and this is just Petsy. This is how it takes your equations. Um, you need a residual, which is basically combining all the terms on your left on your in your equation on the left side, and then you defi you define these f zero and f one, um, and then you define your Jacobian, which is basically a matrix of gradients or a Hessian matrix. Um, and so you get these, this for the Helmholtz equation, you get these residual and Jacobians um, that I'll use 
um, and you have to define those in the code. So implementation, um, uh, Petsy, for a finite element method, Petsy is all based on this idea of a CRLA triple. Um, CRLA actually sort of developed uh, finite element methods, um, and this is kind of at its core how they are um, used. Um, this is all before Ivacus and stuff, and those are kind of using different things, but Petsy uses this basic CRLA triple, which is the definition of a finite element is based on your domain T, um, which is some shape that your mesh is made of triangles or whatever, uh, local space of shape functions V, um, and a set of degrees of freedoms, which is um, a basis for the dual space, uh, a basis for the dual space of V, uh, V star or V prime. So one example of this is a 2D Lagrange finite element. This is like the most basic finite element you can have. Uh, your domain T is just a triangle. Uh, your your um, your local space of shape functions V is going to be given by this space of linear polynomials, very simple um, basis functions. And then your dual space for um, V star, or your basis for V star, the dual space of V is going to be the point evaluations at the vertices of K, K, which is the cell, the local cell, or T, I think. Um, and so that's where you evaluate your linear polynomials is at the vertices. Um, so in Petsy, that CRLA triple is defined by these three functions. So DM plex is, plex is an object that contains the whole structure of your mesh. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a big structure that contains all the elements of mesh, and it's an unstructured mesh. A lot of uses of the structure. but um, So unstructured mesh means it's not it's not just copies of the same cell everywhere. You can have different shapes or different size cells um, in your mesh. And, and it's not necessarily just organized as, you know, simple triangles cutting apart uh, your, your domain. It can be sort of organized more randomly. Uh, your Petsy space is your space of uh, D-dimensional polynomials. Um, so like I said, this could be your, uh, well, your, your linear polynomials or second degree polynomials. Um, and then your dual space is this where you, your evaluation functionals, where, where you're going to be evaluating like at the vertices of your mesh uh, triangle. So um, uh, if I wanted to run my code in Petsy without multigrid, just using a simple Richardson solver, uh, which is a Krylov method, that's basically the most simple form of the Krylov method, uh, just applying that matrix A over and over. Uh, if I wanted to do that with... Um, some preconditioner, which I'll talk about maybe in the next video. Basically, it's a way of simplifying your matrix A so that it's not so complicated to uh, run these calculations. And I'll use successive over relaxation as a common preconditioner. Um, so if I wanted to do that, uh, I would use these sort of options. I would set, I can set a tolerance uh, for the Krylov solver. Um, so just to back up, the, the way Petsy works is you write your code up and then um, these options are already technically written into or set in your code. There's a gen you know a general uh, KSP solver type that it will use. Um, but in Petsy, you can add these options to your command line run. So you can say run Helmholtz and then add these options in, and it'll change up the code a little bit. Um, and that's sort of one of the great things about Petsy is there's so much variability you can have with your code. Um, yeah at the command line of just saying, I want to use a different solver type, or I want to use a different tolerance. Um, so these are a few different options. And then the bottom three are just um, monitors that spit out sort of information about your solve. Um, and then if I wanted to use a multi-grid solver, I can change the uh, preconditioner type to multi-grid. Um, and then there's a few more uh, options to for the multi-grid, like what kind of um, so, uh, uh, preconditioner, I'll use a Jacobi preconditioner for the smoothers, um, which again is a simple kind of form of smoothers. Um, I'll change the Krylov solver to a conjugate gradients. Um, um, and a few more options for multigrid, like what shape you want to use. So there's a few different shapes you could use a multigrid, a V shape, meaning you move just one direction downwards um, towards your coarse grid, and then you move one direction back upwards. Um, towards your fine grid in the shape of a V, but there's also things like F cycles and W cycles. Um, so this is just a basic comparison between the Krylov solvers. So if I were to use Richardson and conjugate gradients, um, and I would keep all the rest of the things the same, this is without multigrid, 
Um, and I believe this is uh, for SOR um, preconditioners. Um, it's just interesting to point out that conjugate gradients is way faster and converges much quicker. Um, so going forward, it's much smarter to use something like conjugate gradients um, because the whole point of this is to speed up uh, calculations. So current state of everything, like I said, the Krylov solver, and I just showed in that plot, the Krylov solvers work fine. Um, they converge. Um, but if I add multigrid, it's causing some error. I think it's an error with the formulation maybe, um, just the way the formulation is written in the code. Uh, I'm still not super sure about what the error is, um, but hopefully I think that's a pretty simple fix if I can find whatever the error is. Um, and then the last thing is just uh, figuring out visualization on the Jetson. So the way Petsy typically works is it'll create some window while it's running and you can see the um, solution. It'll show you some plot of the solution. Uh, but because I'm running through an SSH on a command line with the Jetson, that's not exactly possible. So uh, I have to figure out a way of visualizing the solution and I have to check this uh, method of manufacturing solutions. I, it, the Krylov solvers work in terms of running and converging. I haven't checked that they're actually spitting out the correct solution. So hopefully they are, um, but I'll check that pretty soon. And then the second half of the semester will be, like I said, I got to fix that multigrid error and then it'll be fully working for CPUs. Um, and then I want to add GPU functionality and compare the GPU to CPU on the Jetson to see which one might be faster. And the last thing I want to do is I want to explore this Petsy for Pi. Um, so most Petsy code is written in C, uh, which is how, which is what my current code is written in. Um, but there is functionality for Python. So uh, I'd like to see if I can maybe rewrite it in Python and that will be a little bit easier for everyone to see what's going on. Um, but that's sort of the last kind of stage of once it's all functional, then we can see if we can make it prettier uh, for everyone. So that's where we're where we're at right now and where we're going. Um, and here are just some of the a few of the references that I've been using um, for this project. Uh, so thanks for watching the video and I will see you in the next one.